My guest today is David Agler, whom I had the pleasure of meeting when he was music director of Vancouver Opera. He then took the position of artistic director of Wexford Opera Festival in Ireland, and in 2019, he returned to Vancouver. I would like to just touch on how we actually met when you first came to Vancouver, how we really bonded. I mean, there's a relationship between us. You were on the board of directors of the Vancouver Recital Society for a while. I was for a while. And you and are fantastic. I asked you, I asked you yes. what do you want me to do on the board of directors? I want and you to be you. That's well, what, what I asked, wanted what you to be you. you. Because I, if I was going to go on a board, I needed a, a task, or, you know? Yes. And yes. you said, well, you'll, you'll do exactly what I tell you. <laughs> He's lying, that's, everybody. That's true. <laughs> Oh, gosh, yeah. but you know, the thing about the relationship that David and I have, he's, he's, he's a very intelligent, bright man, and I'm going to use an adjective to describe him now, uh, which I want to use in a very good way. I don't want it to sound pejorative, but you're, a, you're as shrewd as all hell, and you had the measure of me and the measure of my family and my environment within five days of meeting you, right? When I first came to town, I, I yes. asked, well, who makes this town work musically? And, uh, and somebody said, well, the woman you should get to know who has made the most profound uh, contribution to music in this town is Leela Getz. And I have no idea how this transpired, Leela, but I received a summons to the Getz household back when you still lived on 37, 33rd? 30, 32nd, yeah. Wow. Wonderful house. Yes, yes, and, yes. Uh, it, was, it was for Passover. And I remember the, the, that uh, uh, Leon, your husband, was conducting the, the ritual for Passover, and you just blurt out with, Leon, isn't there a short, shorter version of this? And <laughs> I, I have never, I've loved that, your family, ever since that day. David, in his real life, extraordinary life, has really traveled the world as an international opera phenomenon. One of the things I'd like to straighten out here is I have two lengths of time that you ran the Wexford Opera Festival. You were the um, artistic director. Was it for 16 years or for 15 years? It was for 15 years. Um, and that followed, did that follow directly after your stint with Vancouver Opera? No, I think I left Vancouver Opera roughly around 2000. And yes. I, I was, uh, took up the directorship of Wexford in 2005, although I spent the entire year of 2004 uh, involved with Wexford because I was appointed in 2003. But right. in that interval, I spent a very fascinating few years in Princeton, New Jersey, where I had ah. gone, where I'd gone to school. And yes. there, was a, there was a little company there called the Opera Festival of New Jersey. It was, it was a really remarkable uh, little institution right in the middle of Princeton University. And we got to do works like Wozzeck and all this odd stuff that people generally don't want to go see. But of course, part of your reputation is on the fact that you have produced a lot of operas that are very little known to the public. <clears throat> whether they be contemporary operas or operas from the past, right? Well, of course, that is the uh, whole uh, mission of Wexford Festival Opera, is to pre pre present uh, uh, rarely heard, neglected, forgotten works. And uh, so in my, my 15 years at Wexford, I actually produced 94 different um, titles. And we have, uh, over the 70 years there, only two operas were ever repeated. So, David, how, I mean, I guess you did a hell of a lot of research to come up with these operas. That's true, but I have to tell you, Leela, that the best ideas sometime I ever got were people coming through the door of the 
of the opera house in Wexford and sticking little pieces of paper in my pocket. And with, uh, and you, you, there are people that know a lot more about opera than any professional musician, any professional opera man I'll ever know. But I met, I married myself a little bit to the traditions of Wexford, which is uh, 19th century bel canto opera. So Wexford had, would have done 17 different Donizetti operas. And that does not mean Lucia de Lammermoor and the, the ones we all know. We have a, a good tradition of Czech music. Uh, so they would, you would see a lot of Dvorak, Smetana, uh, uh, Fibich. Have you ever heard of Zednik Fibich? Actually, I have. Do you know why? Because of you. Oh, well. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. then, of course, I was brought on because uh, one of the reasons I was appointed was to give um, Europe uh, a feel for North American works, which, whilst we may know them well here, um, are completely unknown or just uh, titles in a book. For instance, Vanessa by Samuel Barber. Yes. Which is a title which is very well known, I think, in North America, but... Uh, people were bowled over. Where is this opera? Where has this music been? I had a lot of pleasure, but I had a lot of people come out the, the door when we were doing The Mines of Sulphur, Richard Rodney Bennett. One woman came out of the theater and said, David, this is the most brilliant, most exciting thing I've ever heard in my 35 years of coming to Wexford. The chairman of uh, Wexford came out of the door and said, artistic director, where'd you find that piece of crap? But oh. you know something, <laughs> of course. So the, actually, you're telling us something very important without even telling us. And you're telling something that's very dear to my heart. And that is that manifestly, the audience at Wexford was hungry to try something new and something different. and that audience obviously was built on trust. Yes. I would say, um, without getting off that subject, people come there hoping, hoping to see something that will change their musical perspective. I never thought I'd hear something like that. I didn't know that music existed. Um, or to hear a new potential artist that would, could become a superstar. And... Uh, but you mentioned the subject of trust. Uh, I think we had that trust here in Vancouver at a certain period, because if you remember back in my time, uh, and I'm certainly not blowing my own horn, but we could put on Peter Grimes and, and the opera Susanna Czech, and we could do Suzanne of Carlo Floyd. We could do a lot of things because I uh, think the public came to trust us insofar as while it may not always be to their taste, it would be really, really well done. And it just might be good for me to hear it. Well, I mean, I think trust is probably one of the most important things. And it's fascinating that you say that because actually the operas that I remember most from Vancouver are the ones that are out of the box, you know, like Yanufa and... Um, Acropolis Caves. Yes, you know... Uh, those are the ones that make really lasting impressions. And, you know, I think you're absolutely right, David. Uh, I don't know what's happened today um, with the opera audience, but just to jump from one topic to another, which perhaps contributes to somehow to this notion of building audiences and trust, I think one of the... Um, handicaps, let's say, great handicap of Vancouver Opera, great handicap of many performing arts institutions in this city is the lack of venues. Well, you know, in, in Australia, which um, has this iconic opera house, it had a so-so uh, opera company. And, um, when the opera house actually opened, it was able to go from a small, okay opera company to a major international ensemble because it had a venue. I, I, I remember when we opened our new opera house in, in, in Wexford, and I have to say that was one of my 
things I'm proudest of is to be able to oversee the building of a new theater. But people came, it increased our, uh, our subscription substantially. And then it was our job to retain um, uh, those people that came out of curiosity for the building. We wanted them to stay for dinner and come back often. So when along in your tenure was the Wexford, the, did the new Wexford Opera House open? Uh, well, I can tell you that we had a very prudent board of directors that very quietly over a period of 12 years simply bought up properties around so that we can consolidate a lot of land right in the city. And they had a long-term vision and they just patiently and prudently went after. Luckily, um, we got a big wad of money out of the Irish government just before the Celtic Tiger collapsed. In December of 2005, the last performance was given and the theater was torn down. Then in 2006, we, we performed in the parish hall. In 2007, we pitched the largest temporary building ever built in Ireland out in Johnstown's castle. And on time, four weeks early, we marched into the new opera house in the autumn of 2008. It was a remarkable story. Oh my goodness. So that's so exciting. And what was the capacity of the Wexford Opera, New Opera House? It's uh, 800 basically for opera. And um, it's built in a Italian opera house uh, horseshoe site. Yes, yes. And uh, the first time the orchestra played in there, the first time somebody sang in there, I have to admit I'm a grown man, but I did start to cry. Yeah. Because we have what are known as some of the greatest acoustics in, in, in the world. I do actually have a question for you to take this back to the notion of singers and uh, because you've been on a lot of juries and you know singers inside out. When a young singer who shows some promise uh, and when I say promise, promise means a career. What I'm trying to get at is, does a young singer who has aspirations have to be able to have a career in an opera house as opposed to some other kind of career singing leader? Now, we know that the venues for song recitals are few and far between, but is there such a thing as a singer who who can be shiny in one genre and not in the other. For sure. I've, I've known excellent young singers that their, their desire was to be a, a concert singer, a recital singer, leader, oratorio. But uh, especially in North America, up to a certain point, if you didn't get into opera, you didn't get known. And, um, and so a lot of... Um, singers got hauled into the opera world out of necessity. In this day and age, David, and especially once COVID is over, uh, and opera is really the probably most expensive performing arts thing to put on, isn't it? The costs are enormous. Other than having great amounts of subsidy from either from individuals or from the state, I can't see how opera companies can continue to survive. Hila Getz, you have just put your finger on, on I think, the news in the next uh, eight, 10 months to a year. Uh, it's going to be savage and it's going to be sad. I personally don't think it's such a bad thing. I believe very much in the idea of uh, creative deconstruction. And if some of these uh, institutions go under, some of them should go under simply because um, they're badly run. But more importantly, they've just turned into businesses that repeat the same thing over and over again. I, I'm out of this, I'm too old. But I just know my young colleagues are going to come up with something new and different. Um, one of the greatest lessons I ever had in my concert-going career was given to me by the great um, 
Oh God, Sir, Sir, what's his first name? Alan. Um, Thomas British Allen. Thing. Huh? Thomas Allen. Thomas Allen, right? Uh, he, Rena Sharon, used to run a summer program in Vancouver, and she brought him to do a recital at the Chan Center. It was in the middle of summer, and I'm a huge fan of his, and so I went to the concert. Now. By that time, this is about 12 or 14 years ago, he was already getting up there in age. And his voice clearly was not what it used to be. But what he taught me that evening was that it's about so much more than the voice. It's about the power of the communication. And it was one of the most extraordinary performances I've ever attended. I'm delighted to hear you say that because uh, uh, Tom Allen's a, a really close mate of mine. And uh, he came, you mentioned the state his voice in was 10 or 12 years ago. He came two years ago to sing in Wexford. Now, it, yes. was, it was in uh, one of our venues, which seats only 300. After five minutes, you were unaware of his voice anymore, but you yes. were just taken into his communicative world, uh, his world of his imagination. Yes. I mean, in, in many ways, he, he is one of the greatest artists I've ever come across. I think that is the essence of what makes a great artist, is that power of communication, that honesty, that direct, you know, last night, Leon and I were watching a documentary, which I'd never seen before, um, which was actually made in 1981, about Marie Pariah. It was so extraordinary, because everything he does is just so perfect, it's so right, and it's done with such knowledge and joy and passion and communication. And I think that's what sets some artists above, way above others. It's the communication. Is that more important to you now, Leela, than it might have been 30 years ago? When I was younger, I was just taken in by perfect performances and uh, performances with um, extraordinary technical control. And as I've gotten older, um, that means less to me. I'm much more interested if I feel the artist on whatever medium is trying to say something. Absolutely, and, David. Yeah. And even with even with vocal music, opera, after a certain point, it's not even the words that are important. It's it's the sound of their instrument with which they're communicating. Well, actually, as you say that. I've noticed all over Facebook, uh, I think it would have been the something birthday of Maria Callas uh, a few days ago. And is she not an example? I mean, I don't know enough about voice to say she had a great voice or she had not such a great voice. But the, it seems to me, sitting on the sidelines, that she was an example of a communicator, a great actress, and an everything else that's required. And if the voice wasn't top of the top of the top, that was okay because everything else made up for it. I completely agree with you. She was extraordinary. But um, transferring that to something like the piano, um, <laughs> where yes. Pianos have a certain similarity to sound where every every great voice is or every unique voice is you can I you can say that is that person, that is that person. But with the piano and the sound being more or less sim the same, how does a pianist do to the piano what um, Maria Callas did with, with her voice? That's the age old question. I mean, when I, when I sit on juries, uh, or when I find performers, it's simply magic that I'm looking for. And what is magic? 
It's communication. And how can five different people play the same instrument and transport you into different places? I don't know. That's the, that, you know what, David? It's the seeking for the answer that keeps me going to concerts. It's that personal experience in the concert hall. I've been conducting my whole life and, uh, and, and playing song recitals. I, used, I played hundreds of them in my youth. Um, and I think, of, uh, looking back, I can probably count on two hands evenings or performances in which I thought um, I did better than I myself am. And this is something that every artist begs for, prays for, uh, suffers for, is to one night completely leave themselves. And who, whoever knows where the inspiration comes from, I don't know. That's exactly right. You know, it's funny. I don't know what made me think of this now. But many years ago, Leon and I went to a, I think it was an Indonesian restaurant or something on Broadway here in Vancouver. So there, there was a dessert item on the menu. And I said to Leon, what do you think this is? And he said, I don't know. So the waiter came to take our order. And I said to the waiter, you see this? what does this taste like? And the waiter looked at me and he said, Madam, if you tell me what a banana tastes like, I'll tell you what this dessert tastes like. And Leon gave him the biggest tip I've ever seen Leon give. <coughs> so, you know, it's, uh, it's a matter of how do you describe these things? It's one thing you take them in, and you savor them and they become a part of your being. And sometimes, who was the uh, artist who said, writing about, Baldessari, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. I mean, some things are beyond words, aren't they? Um, speaking of food and desserts, before... <laughs> Before I die, you have to make for me once again that, that South African stew with a name I cannot pronounce. Babuti? Yes. Oh, with pleasure. You mean the one where I poisoned a lot of people? I don't you know that. You don't know that? Oh, God, I'll tell you this quickly, and then I've got to let you go. Um, it was during the Chamber Music Festival, and I made a huge thing of babuti because it was always a very popular dish and it's basically it's it's ground meat that you put curry in and onions and grated apple and cut up apricots and egg and bread and milk and you mix it all together with your hands and then you bake it and you make a custard on the top and uh, so it was after the chamber music festival it was actually the last concert in the festival and friday night Saturday, um, I was to go uh, and meet Sarah and to have lunch with her. Well, that morning, Leon woke up and he said he was feeling decidedly off. And so I said, okay. Then I went to meet Sarah and she said she was feeling off. And so I drove her home and she was as sick as a dog. I came home and Leon looked terrible. And I took him to a UBC hospital. And we checked in and sure enough, he was getting dehydrated. So he's lying in the bed there. And then two other people, <laughs> it's not funny, came into the hospital who had been at the dinner that night. Uh, one was a young woman who worked with me, and the other one was a concert goer who had been at the party. Anyway, to cut a long story short, and this is interesting, um, one of the eggs that was in the custard had salmonella, or whatever it's called. So 
where that egg landed in the mix and the people who ate from that area were the ones who got sick. In the hospital, I'm waiting with Leon and other people are coming in with this disease. And I said in a not soft voice, that's funny. All these people who are getting sick were at my house for dinner last night. Whereupon someone in the uh, hospital said, wait a minute, what's this? We need to get the health people involved. So on the Monday, I was visited by a city health inspector <laughs> who told me, and I said to him, I've got a real problem here because I'm having another party in a few weeks and I need to make a dish that's got eggs in it that are not completely cooked. And he said to me, well, then you've got to go and buy, um, you know, the eggs that come in uh, they come in like milk cartons. Have you seen them, David? The pasteurized eggs or something. And I, I had this momentary, ugh, I tried to imagine the chicken sitting on the milk carton laying eggs. In Leela. any case. <laughs> uh, but I started making babuti again, and it's wonderful, and it hasn't actually ever killed anybody. And we've never had that incident again, but boy, does Sarah dwell on it. Oh, I'd be happy to make it for you, Dave. Before we, before we say goodbye to each other, uh, you know, your, your Chamber Music Festival always gave me such pleasure. And I was, as the summer was one of the few times I was home in, in, in those years in San Francisco, usually in the regular season I was gone. So I so, miss so much of what you and other uh, operations in the city did. Um, that was really a great period of, of, of the Vancouver Recital Society's outcome. I, I, think I so. understand I, completely why you needed to discontinue. Yeah, but that bro it broke my heart, it, David. Isn't there a place for something like that again in our town? Yes, yes. Find the bloody venue. Okay, if I find a bloody venue, <laughs> will you put it on? <laughs> You betcha. And you know what? If that happens, I will expect you to be on my board. Not I my see. board, our board. You okay. have never now, changed. Now, you have to go to work, huh? You have never changed. You're, you're such an operator, Lila Getz. <laughs> oh, David, you too. That's why I love you so much. Take Thank care, you girl. so much for being with me today. Bye.